All right, cool. Uh, so you guys, so we'll, we'll, we have a, a field trip logistics to talk about. Um, we'll do that after our uh, guest here uh, finishes up her presentation. Um, so, uh, so we'll get to all that. So keep, keep those uh, things. Um, although we do have, I do have two um, waiver liability forms. One is from, from Catherine. <laughs> so so um, if you guys, if you're just sitting around while we're listening, uh, you might want to just sign your name to those and just sort of circulate them around. So there's, there's yeah, there's, there's that one that uh, Victor has and then uh, the other one and just your name and date and just printed name and sign it. And I think that's fine. And let, let me just check real quick since, can I see that real quick? Uh, so, so we just so it's just you guys just like this, uh, like just like fill it out. Where's that? And let me just say, so Catherine, just make sure. So I was filling out like this. Is it you? Is it okay to put our names down here? Is that what you wanted? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So yeah, so you guys just uh, yeah, just just fill them out. Uh, so one is for where the camping place we're staying, and the other is for Caltrans. So, so yeah. Uh, I appreciate it. And oh, we'll, and um, are are you able to bring hard hats and vests? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's imperative. That we have to have that because the job will be an active construction site on Friday. They'll be they'll be working. So. Yeah, and so this is where I mean maybe so also I'll just check one more thing before uh, I forget. Um, but I'll just toss this. Uh, so this is where. So is this where we're meeting, like five minutes north of the, is it five minutes north of the elephant seals or is it south? I can't remember. North. Yeah, you've got no, it. Okay. The, the, the hotel, the yeah, state okay, park right, okay. uses that that's, now. That's what I thought. Just, just we'll, work in, we'll start at the parking lot and then go from there. And then I sent uh, an agenda and a kind of a um, current write-up of the project and awesome. some key points um, that we had to address in design and construction. Um, and then I put in a map of where we're gonna go on the project and how much time we're gonna spend at each place. And then I also sent the poster that I presented at a wildlife symposium. Awesome. And I've also presented at the International Conference on Transportation and Ecology poster session a few years ago back in Sacramento. Um, I might present this project in Colorado next year. Um, anyway, so that's a good poster. It's kind of a one-stop shop on. I love it. Uh, I, I, I glanced at it and it looks awesome. So I'll definitely put that in our it. info packet for the students. So that's I a lot of time was spent that. trying to make it so that you could just really look at the graphics and really understand all the different things that we had to consider on this project. And then some of the, not only the planning aspects and, collaboration and then all the, the permitting stuff and all the endangered species, but um, some of the design minimization techniques that we we worked on inner, inner uh, you know, collaboratively with other disciplines and um, also in construction. So awesome. it's important and, to know all those things. So I love it. And then I just got, I just heard from, also before I, like, we kick off, I just heard from Chad. Um, and he said that he is, is also has time and is more than happy to come meet with us um, uh, after we meet okay. with you. So, so I was thinking we were going to wrap. So we'll get to you about 10, 15, 10, 30, somewhere around yeah, in that you know, frame. And then, um, and then I figured it's like, and you tell me, hour, hour and a half with you, something like that. And so then I said, you know, afterwards, we'll go down and, uh, and, and meet with him. So he's just going to talk to us. He's not going to like take us on a tour, but we're going to meet with him. He's going to talk about the stuff just south of Carmel, I guess. The realignment. South stuff, of Carmel, south. north of Piedras. Yeah. So yeah. Are, is he meeting you at the Piedras site or are you driving north to meet him? So I asked him if he wanted to go north. He's like, well, you know, I'm coming from the south. So um, we also are going to stop in at the um, uh, NOAA's interpretive center at, at San Simeon. So I'm just going to meet him at San Simeon at the, at near the pier. We're going to meet him at the pier. Oh, okay. Good. That sounds great. Okay. All right. Well, well with, all that, with all that <laughs> intro, everybody, uh, so uh, thanks for uh, hanging out for a minute while, while we banter and I do some logistics. So um, okay. I'm happy to introduce uh, Catherine here, uh, uh, w one of many people over the years from Caltran District 5 that's been very generous with their time that um, have shown us various management um, challenges, various uh, solutions that have implemented, talked about the logistical hassles, bureaucratic hassles, permitting challenges, just all that kind of stuff with maintaining, you know, connective transportation corridors in a dynamic area like the coastal zone. 
and so um, so we're gonna we have you all will have a chance to to meet in person and, and talk and ask questions and walk around some of these uh, sites uh, in in a few days. But um, Catherine very kindly agreed to give us a, an introductory um, uh, sort of contextual lecture today so that you're all prepared. And so um, with that, um, uh, our our Caltrans. Uh, our Caltrans guru who now wears a million hats, uh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So my presentation, if I talk really fast, is about an hour and a half. I think you said we have until noon. Like, I, yep, do you want me to take, do this in a fast? So if we're not rushed, we're not rushed. You, we're can, not rushed. you can ask me questions throughout then. You don't need to wait till the end. Um, I did this recently where I had to really bust it out in an hour and a half and it was, it was pretty fast. So um, I have four different presentations. They're all, you know, have little breaks in between. So um, feel free to, I'm not the best at PowerPoint presentations on Zoom. So if, just speak up or, you know, I may see your hand raised, I might not. So um, Sean, I'll, I'll have you be the moderator. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I don't have a camera hooked up, you guys. So so if, if that is a question, totally cool. Just walk on up so uh, you, your face mm -hmm. could be in the screen when you ask your question. But yeah, it's a great. lot of information. So um, it's kind of uh, all consuming. So I'll just give you a brief um, introduction of who I am. Uh, Catherine Brown, I was raised on the West Coast in uh, Carmel Valley, just north of Big Sur. A lot of camping and backpacking in my life, um, big family. Spent most of my life outside on my horse, um, wandering around the beach and the rivers. So I had a lot of exposure to uh, aquatic systems. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And then when I went to Berkeley, I discovered landscape architecture, which included all of my loves of the outdoors, um, drawing, um, three-dimensional thinking, math, science, plants, of course, and uh, you know, architectural design. So that's how I became a landscape architect. And I went to work immediately in this at the city and county of San Francisco and did a lot of park design and streetscape design, urban design. And then I went to private sector in San Diego and worked on um, high end uh, international projects in Tahiti and Hawaii and lots of open space planning and high end. Um, high-end stuff. So my life took a turn and ended up in the Midwest, uh, became a mom, uh, worked and did my own design called, uh, side job, and then started a farmer's market in town and worked on Main Street guidelines for the- Everything, small you did everything. Done a little bit of everything, yeah. <laughs> uh, but my passions are, or were, and still are um, environmental, preservation and restoration. And so when I uh, ended up moving to back to California with my two girls, I got a job at Caltrans and um, loved every minute. I've been working at, at this organization for almost 25 years. So it's kind of like my third career. Um, and it's just been a learning curve. It's pretty much been straight up. Uh, my boss, my bosses along the way have allowed me to kind of specialize in restoration ecology and uh, work on very difficult projects and they're very challenging, but I really love the challenge. So Piedras is one of the many, many, many projects I've worked on and I've been working on it for about 15 years. Um, I was given this project back when it was in what we called the PID phase, where we're developing the project initiation document. So in our in our world in landscape architecture or in Caltrans, there are about four different phases. There's project initiation document, the environmental and project report phase, which we call P and E D. And then there's the plan specs and estimates where we develop the documents for construction. And then there's construction. So there's about four different phases in projects. So I've been on the project since then for about 15 years. And the project Adris has been divided up into about eight different projects. So there was the road realignment project, which where we realigned the road three mile, uh, for three miles inland, about 500 feet. And um, since we did that realignment, there have been many restoration projects along the way. And I've been leading those um, break off projects. Um, I was support on the road project and then 
uh, leading as the lead designer on restoration projects. So that's me. And I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. I hope it all works out. I've got yeah, you should, be able, you should be able to share no problem. It should, it should be easy. Okay, hold on just a second. I'm going to. I hope this works. Okay. Can you yep, see my can, screen? We can see it. Can you maximize it so it's a little bit the full uh, full view? So I, I think maybe if you um, if maybe it's displace. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it might be one of those. I think it might be one of those, or no? Uh, maybe the one. Hmm. Try. Um, uh, it could well, be uh, it could be display settings. Maybe. Hold on. Let me switch screens. The all, all the excitement of PowerPoint. I know I'm not the best. No, 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 it's all good. So while while she's uh, calling that up, I'll just say you guys that um, uh, uh, Andrew Dominguez, one of our old students, used to work for District Five. Um, uh, uh, we've had several students over the years work for Caltrans, and so. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I mean, this is the point of this is not to get anybody an internship or a job or anything, but, but, but this kind of stuff is a direct, is a fantastic place to apply um, uh, your learning and your, your skill set, and it's uh, desperately needed uh, in, in many of these sectors. So, um, so cool. Okay, I'm going to, oh, wait a minute. Okay. can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see it. We can see we see everything. So we see the the slide, the side sorter, and your notes. How about yeah, now? That's good. That's perfect. That's perfect. Right, there you go. Okay, awesome. I think now we're 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 going. All right. So let me go back a slide. That looks like a management challenge to me. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So uh, this is the reason why we uh, ended up working on this project. Um, it's a, like as Sean said, it's about uh, five miles north of the elephant seals. This is um, Pearson need is illustrated in this photo it's close to the ocean with high surf and frequently over top highway. As you can imagine, this is quite dangerous for drivers. Imagine driving 55 miles per hour and a wave suddenly crashes on top of your car. This kind of flooding and wave action eats away at the shoreline. When a road, when a road is that close to the shore, it undermines the pavement, causing gullies and sinkholes, and also is a safety hazard. Climate change exacerbates the problem with sea level rise and uh, shoreline erosion, essentially moves the ocean. Uh, more inland. So this is this is like the gist of our project. Each of the project was clear shoreline erosion into the highway was a huge safety uh, problem for drivers and for pedestrians. For decades, Caltrans attempted to address the problems by adding large rocks armor the shoreline and filled the pavement where it had subsided due to erosion. Caltrans also built small detours, which were called dew flies. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Um, uh, no, I, 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 I've, not, I've not heard that term before. Yeah, so we had over the years, many little turnouts and shoe flies that moved the highway away for little little sections of the highway. But these were short term and temporary, um, the band aids that didn't last. The project purpose was to provide a long term solution to acceler that accelerated, solution that accelerated the rates of coastal erosion and protect the highway from coastal erosion for the next 100 years. Uh, this was a complex design. Many things had to be considered. Many new ideas included many uh, ideas that were also rejected. Final design involved three mile reroute of the highway inland, building three bridges and removing and restoring 
old roadbed. I'll discuss that later in a couple more slides. The design review is later in the presentation as well. Environmental review entailed an environmental assessment for NEPA and an environmental impact report for CEQA. Over 10 alternatives were considered but eliminated after thorough evaluation. For those who aren't familiar with CEQA, and I'm not the best to talk about all the environmental permitting, um, but I definitely have to implement everything I'm told by environmental, required the project, uh, the project proponent to select the least environmentally damaged alternative. And then I'm also going to say there were many sensitive um, Native American sites on this project as well, cultural sites. So that was also blended into the alignment of the project. There were numerous permits, which uh, I'll get into a little bit. The project took three years to build and additional time to complete mitigation. It's ongoing. It's been going on for, I don't know, six years. Uh, Time to complete mitigation requirements after construction. Okay. Yeah, here we are eight years after construction now in Caltrans. We still haven't completed all the mitigation. There were many challenges during and after construction that I'll get into a little later. Any questions so far? Not yet, not yet. Some people might be familiar with either the Piedras Blancas Lighthouse that is the south end of the project or the Elephant Seal viewing area that is about, well, this site says one mile south. So you can kind of get your bearings here, um, uh, kind of where where this project lands in the whole scheme of Big Sur and San Francisco. And then those this shows, um, the project vicinity map shows uh, the begin and end project, um, 100 year shoreline and the different um, alignments of the highway. This shows the numerous partners um, that we need to work with. Hearst Ranch, which is our adjacent property to the east, California State Parks. They own the land to the west and we're also coordinating with them uh, with the uh, coastal trail alignment and we're actually building part of the alignment on our wetland project, building a boardwalk through our project as good neighbors to them. And um, some of the regulators like CDFW and California Coastal Commission. The project constructed three miles of new highway, realigned um, the road and built three new bridges. Many utilities had to be relo relocated which is a significant coordination challenge during construction. That was interesting. I'd never really had a project where I had to realign three miles of um, utilities, undergrounding uh, AT&T and um, PG&E. And you'll and I'll, see there. I'll just chime in, that's super non-trivial. So our $70 million wildlife Big. crossing in Agura, um, uh, you know, we first designed it, the guesstimate was maybe 6 million, and then it became 12 million, then it became 20 million, and the current project design is 70 million. Um, a large chunk of that um, cost is just the utilities. And I just heard at a meeting two weeks ago um, that uh, we're having some budget overruns. <laughs> and so to keep <laughs> under budget, um, the way there's, we're saving, I don't know the exact, I can't remember the number, I wanna say like 6 million or 8 million, is to only underground some of the utilities under mm -hmm. the under Agura Road. So, so not, not the 101, but the, the frontage road just adjacent to the 101. And I was super bummed, but that's what they decided. So they're doing, I forget what it is. I think we're doing power and water, but not, not telecom or some such thing. So th this comment is not a throwaway comment you just made. This is really, really fundamental. There, it's, it's incredibly complex, the stuff that we yeah. don't even see. It's, and it has to get right. You can't just start doing stuff. And, and it's really, really um, uh, right. a challenge. Because you have to not only coordinate with the utility companies, which takes a long time. They're short staff. They have a lot going yeah. on. Um, and the avenues of coordination are, are kind of um, difficult to navigate if you're not an engineer, which I'm not an engineer, I'm a landscape architect. So as the lead in helping with the road realignment and doing the, all of the utility stuff was um, 
challenging too because of the the visual impacts was primarily the reason we undergrounded the the um, utilities and it and at a certain point on our project on the northern section the um power poles do come up on a pole and then you know, back into the Hearst Ranch. So uh, aligning those those utilities away from the road uh, prism and making sure that the visual components were in accordance with the coastal development permit, which is called the CDP with the Coastal Commission, very important and takes a lot of co collaboration. <laughs> Okay, so then you have to work with the contractors and all the different um, utility companies as they're independent from the contractor and they usually have to be done prior to construction, but sometimes they come in after the fact. So all of that has to be kind of thought about. <clears throat> Another big important topic was something that I brought into the project and I think it should, it should be involved included in every project is collecting topsoil. Um, I built it into the environmental document and some of our preliminary plans and had to really f be persistent in um, developing that concept and getting it through in the approvals of the uh, estimate and the project uh, plans early on because the environmental document is a legally binding document. And because I had the language in that, it gave the project more teeth to keep topsoil collection on the project, part of the project, which really helped with seed bank and mycorrhizae and keeping that on the, on the project. So the topsoil that was removed where the new highway was to be built. This was um, very pristine land. It had been grazed by hearse cattle for ever. Um, so I felt it was really important to salvage that topsoil uh, for use in restoration with the native seed bank and beneficial mycorrhizae. I'll touch on that, what a huge effort that was later on in this, this presentation. Four large box culverts were removed from the old highway and where two of the bridges were constructed resulted in restoring lagoon habitat to fish and marine animals. Coastal lagoons are important rearing areas for federally listed steelhead, trout, and tidewater goby. And culvert, the culvert at Royal de la Corral was removed. Caltrans biologists rescued and relocated over 1,200 fish, many of which were tidewater goby, six California red legged frogs, 13 southwestern pond turtles. And remember that the RSP, which is Rock Slope Protection and Caltrans terminology, that we had uh, been filling over the past decades. And one of the reasons why this project had to occur was the Coastal Commission wasn't going to permit us any more for putting more rock to, to um, protect our highway. So we had to pull it out. And when we did, um, it ended up being a black abalone habitat. <laughs> so it took Caltrans and the contractor six months to come up with a rock removal plan that the Coastal Commission would approve. California State Parks required Caltrans to install elephant seal fencing to prevent seals from getting into proposed coastal trails and onto the highway. Elephant seals proved to be a huge challenge during construction and more on this later. So one of the things I also learned um, by doing, even though I didn't go to Cal Poly, but that's their motto, um, I really fought hard too in the development of the project to develop fencing plans. Because this project was so big, so long, and so complicated in the fencing aspect, keeping cattle out, keeping cattle in, keeping the contractor out of certain areas, elephant seals, you know, we had a lot going on with fencing. So I'm really glad we, we, um, we won the fight to develop fencing plans in the plan set because it really uh, became very helpful in the whole project. Uh, Caltrans evaluated over 600 acres of coastal habitat as part of the environmental review process. By comparison, we rarely evaluate more than 50 acres for a single project. And you can see all the little piers that we uh, have on the project, um, both flora and fauna. 
Um, the wetland delineation was extremely challenging because of varying site conditions, lots of pockets of wetlands as opposed to large tracts of wetlands, very dark soils that made it extremely difficult to see hydric soils, indicators, subsurface wetland hydrology, and I'll touch on that later, that has to do with coastal prairie wetlands. And the coastal prairie wetlands and combined with clay soils was almost impossible to evaluate during the spring when plant growth was optimal. Four regulatory authorities regulated the wetlands and they disagreed on the delineation amongst themselves and with Caltrans biologists. This was a big deal. Caltrans had to redo and update the delineation many times. So things kept changing as we kept developing the project. Um, Threatened and endangered species, South Central California coastal steelhead, California red-legged frog, water goby, rare plants included, compact cobwebby thistle, Hickman's onion, San Luis Obispo, owl's clover, adobe, sanical, dwarf golden star, San Luis Obispo said, Perseonothus and maritime Cianothus. Some watch this plant species as well, like ocean bluff, milk vetch, Cambria morning glory, pink star tulip, harlequin lotus, Gardner's yampa and small leafed lomadium. I'm almost I, done with this. Catherine, I, should just, I just say for clarity, one of my colleagues who'll be joining us, uh, one of my co instructors, uh, Brenton Spees, is uh, like the state guru for Tidewater Gobi. Just, just so oh, you know. really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He is. Hi. Hello, hello. How's it going? I'm doing well. Thanks for chatting with the class. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I have to talk so fast. I have so much to go over. No, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're almost done with the first section. I just have a few more slides. Um, this map has a lot of information on it. So I'll go through some of the key points. Um, you can see uh, the new alignment here um, to the east and the old alignment hugging the coastline and all of the mapping showing all the wetlands. Um, the dark pink is existing wetlands. The yellow is temporary impacts to coastal prairie along the uh, old and new sections of highway. Blue and purple are temporary and permanent impacts. And the reason why we have to dif differentiate between permanent and temporary is because you mitigate them at different um, mitigation ratios. And it seems like all the agencies have different criteria. <laughs> so it's kind of difficult to process and make sure we meet all the requirements. Um, and we pretty much met all of our uh, monitoring requirements on this project, but it's been quite a challenge. Also, we had I'll get into this later, but we had um, wet years when we did the delineation. Then we had um, drought years when we were doing other portions of the project. So like we were doing seed collection for some of the erosion control. It was really difficult to collect native seed when we were in a drought condition and getting all the seed we needed. The green hatching shows the restoration areas um, there were, where old roadbed was removed. So we had to restore the old roadbed. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But as a landscape architect, I really pushed to uh, do the contour grading. I did it by hand, old fashioned way, um, where we took out uh, fill slopes and then filled cut slopes and, and did contour grading, natural landform grading to make it look as though from the eye, you, you can't tell that it was an old roadbed other than maybe some of the vegetation because we're restoring it really difficult. But um, landform wise, we restored to old, um, matching old form. This table shows permanent loss of habitats displaced by the new highway, uh, which equal permanent impacts and temporary impacts were twice as much, four times as much for coastal prairie. Permitting took about three years, which is about three times as long as the typical Caltrans project. There were six different natural resource regulatory agencies and associated permits that I'll get into in the next slide. Each regulated similar resources slightly differently, resulting in unique requirements for mitigation and monitoring, that which are all spelled out in the mitigation and monitoring plan, which 
I'll get into later, a document required by some regulators. Uh, the additional mitigation required by the Water Board and Coastal Commission resulted in Caltrans having to develop a plan to create wetlands with bentonite clay, and I'll get into that a little later too. So these, this chart shows, um, illustrates the complex regulatory oversight on the project, Army Corps of Engineers, three parameter emergent wetlands, three and riparian wetlands, three parameter wetlands. Um, but for a very quick review under the Federal Clean Water Act, wetlands are defined by three parameters, wetland vegetation, hydric soils, and wetland hydrology. Coastal Commission, everything in the coastal zone, especially the entire project under the California Coastal Act, wetlands are defined by just one of the three parameters. Uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife streams are streams right riparian and wildlife, and National Marine Fisheries Service stream habitat because of listed steelhead and also elephant seals and black abalone. Regional Water Quality Control Board, three parameter wetlands, riparian habitat, stream habitats, and on this project, upland buffer habitat. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I mean, I can go on. This gets, it's very complicated, <clears throat> and I have more text to read, but I don't want to yeah, but I'd say this is key, you guys, because this is this is a soup of agencies that that you have to deal with. And this is you might think, oh, Caltrans is a state agency, so it's easy or, or mm -hmm. it is uh, easier. Um, it's it's not it's it's like they're held to the same standard, essentially, as someone putting in an apartment building or or some other private development or whatever. And right. Um, it and is, I think for me, the, the most complicated thing, even though I'm not the environmental generalist, the environmental generalist is in charge of handling all of the specialists that uh, contribute to the environmental document. As a landscape architect, that would be considered the visual impact of evaluation uh, or assessment. But as the implementer, as a landscape architect, implementing what envir the environmental group has agreed with the permitting agencies, we're the ones who are implementing what needs to be restored or enhanced or replaced. So we're, we're in the middle of the wheel trying to coordinate with all the different agencies, the engineers, the contractor, construction, oversight, engineers, and environmental, the biologists, the aquatic specialists, anyway. It's, it's fun and exciting. I don't want to need to bog you down with too much. <laughs> uh, we couldn't uh, mitigate for all the project impacts um, on site. So we had to find development plans for offsite mitigation. And we were going to do an offsite mitigation at Arroyo de la Cruz, but that fell through for various reasons. So uh, currently we are mitigating on site. That's the project we're gonna, I'm going to show you on Friday. Uh, it's a wetland restoration project, and uh, we also have another offsite at Toro Creek, which is closer to Cayucas. Okay, so any questions? This is a little killdeer um, uh, mama, or maybe it's the dad, I don't know. Um, and then you see the four little eggs underneath. So this bird was doing the broken wing. Uh, dance and we couldn't figure out where the nest was and we were all kind of look, have our feet up in the air and everything trying to figure out because you cannot see the eggs in the in the pebbles. We finally found her over her nest and I was able to get that picture. We didn't mean to be that close to it. It just happened. <laughs> well, that's, that's cool. cool. That's cool. <laughs> anyway. All right. Questions so far about this, this intro sort of set up context uh, things. Making sense? Everybody's following along, no problem. Do you want to take a quick uh, five minute yeah, break? Well, five minute break, and I'll get set up for the next um, okay. bunch of slides. Perfect. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, whenever you're whenever you're whenever you're ready, we're we're good to go. Okay, everybody, back in their seats. <laughs> uh, 90 90 percent of them. So yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. All right. All right, so uh, as you can see, the new road alignment was located approximately 500 feet from the existing road. 
due to sea level rise and eroding coastline. Design, we designed the new road in a curvilinear fashion to allow for minimized environmental impacts and maximize driver's views to the ocean. The visual impact evaluation is a, is a pretty big deal, uh, especially along the coast with the scenic highway. So keep that in mind uh, whenever you're working on a project, visual impacts are key. The mosaic of coastal prairie, coastal prairie wetlands, freshwater seep wetlands and coastal scrub vegetation types are within the footprint. Um, as you can see, these access roads here, we tried to align them uh, for con the contractor to get their heavy equipment in and around and still use the old alignment. We kept the old road open for a majority of the project in order to build the new alignment and then have access for construction. So we minimized the um, the footprint uh, on the land. So coordinating off, I call it the donut hole in between the two alignments to create environmentally sensitive areas with fencing was um, paramount to preserve as much habitat as possible and keep it from the contractor from driving all over it. Uh, this uh, through innovative design of coastal lagoons and wetlands, avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures and construction techniques, the project resulted in reduced resource impacts and restoration. That sentence took a long time to craft because it's kind of a one-stop shop on <laughs> all the all the terminology of what this project means. This photograph is taken from. Uh, Arroyo del Corral, there are four waterways. There's Arroyo de los Playaños, which is the southernmost water uh, creek. Um, Arroyo del uh, Corral, and Arroyo del Oso, and um, there's the fourth one. Sorry, I'm missing my all my creeks. But this shows the old alignment where we restored wetlands. And I came up with this idea. Was, I can't claim it as my own, but I, there was a woman up in, in Oakland, Caltrans was working on a project where she was taking sod and re using the sod cutouts from adjacent wetlands and restoring wetlands. And so I used her idea, wrote the spec, and we used plugs and sod from the areas that were undisturbed in the wetlands and then replanted them in these uh, coastal, prairie wetlands and freshwater seep wetlands on the old alignment. That's what you're seeing is kind of grid pattern. Another innovative design was landform grading. I, I mentioned it a little bit in, in engineering the old alignment, but also the new alignment, we <clears throat> tried to blend the uh, landforms to make them blend with the natural landforms you, you generally see out there. Uh, you can see this from uh, the before slide of the old alignment off to the right here, and then you can see the new alignment is going to come off to the left. And then when we're all said and done, how that new alignment kind of blends in with this uh, slope rounding is what we call it in our engineering world that it's not just a two to one cut. So it just, um, addresses the uh, visual needs for visual impact assessments for the permits, cut and fill balance. And um, I know it's not obvious, uh, but we wanted to make it so that you didn't realize there was an old road and the new road, look, make it look as natural as possible. They've been there for a long time. We created coastal prairie wetlands where previous wetlands had been prior to a house uh, construction. We took out a couple houses to realign the highway. And we, before, prior to building the wetlands on the offsite location, we were gonna do a pilot project rebuilding coastal prairie wetlands using bentonite clay. So in order to build coastal prairie wetlands, coastal prairie wetlands have a subsurface clay pan layer, which 
creates a perched water table and it flows very generally, very uh, subtly from east to west. So it's kind of like a, a perched water table seat that just flows subterranean about a foot to 18 inches below finished grade. So in researching all of that, we decided, I decided to use bentonite, which is a natural clay material that's mined um, in like Utah and Wyoming. And it's a powder substance. You typically use it in drilling operations. It becomes very viscous, very slimy. Um, but when you blend it with native soil, which we call in situ, so you're going to hear that term in situ, which means native material. Um, we blended it in lifts and we tested it with an infiltrometer, which you see here. So I had soil scientists and restoration ecologists on my team that I hired as consultants to help me figure all this out. Um, and this just shows the innovative design using the wetland bentonite clay. I'm going to be showing you more bentonite application, but we did it in a different method on our current wetland project. So these were just two small wetlands and I'll show you more in the coming slides. Another uh, innovative design, which is what we call the burrito wrap. And what we did is because we were building essentially a line through this wetland seep, we had water subterranean and surface water on the east side that was flowing to the west like a big shelf. And we were building a road right through that. So in order to, to link that hydraulic system, we worked with engineers and, and um, geotech and construction to get this developed early on in the design phase. So a lot of this has to happen way early to be innovative and think outside the box we we um we built the road on a permeable material rock filled burrito wrap of uh, rock wrapped in fabric under the highway to allow for that perch water table to flow under the right roadway at Tulsa Prairie Wetland Sessions, and it worked really well. Uh, so this. Um, Shows you some before and afters of how we designed a lot of these bridges with least impact to the land. Uh, we worked with structures engineers up in, in headquarters. Uh, you can see looking east, you can see the natural landforms and the grazed land along Hertz Ranch. Um, after we put in the bridge, um, the bridge design has the least amount of impacts to the wetlands, Spani Arroyo de los Playanos wetlands. So in building and determining the methods and means of, of how we were gonna have construction access to build these bridges, we used a trestle type construction technique. And we also used wetland mats underneath the bridge so that we didn't leave, uh, we didn't disturb the ground. So when they pulled the mats off, um, the mats distribute weight and they, they prevent the wheel ruts, uh, the compaction. So we protected the wetlands under the bridges. So they restored really quickly after the wetland mats were taken up. Here's another before and after <clears throat> at Arroyo de los Playaños, which is the furthest south uh, wetland. Um, to the west, you can see there is the culvert here, the old highway. And um, and then afterwards, we, we built the bridge with the road on uh, more the east side. So I, so I suppose it goes without saying, you guys, but just to be clear, we've heard this before in some other settings too, but so, you know, for the engineers, they generally want stuff compacted. They generally want stuff solid, not moving, you know, tightly packed types of structures. Most ecology most living things don't want things to be solid like a rock mm -hmm. right they want that less compaction so there's a challenge and then but why say one thing that we that we all agree on is the thing on the left here that Catherine's showing that was sort of old design 
And that's bad for both the engineering, the engineered structures as well as the natural structures, but that's what we had. And so, so this is a case where the one on the right is better for both structure. It, it's less constraining of water, so it's less likely to, to flood or have overtopping of the road or whatever, but it's also good for wildlife movement and everything. So, so sometimes you have to work in opposition, but sometimes we can figure out ways of doing it that, that benefits everybody at the same time. Right. And that's a good point, Sean. It's really important, and I can't stress this enough, to develop relationships with your team mm -hmm. because you're going to have opposing uh, thoughts and ideas of how to address certain things, but you need to listen well on the rules and regulations and engineering laws that they have to abide to. Uh, with and also the environmental side of the house. So they're the like opposing concepts, but you have to find middle ground and that is uh, key. <laughs> Collaboration and communication, always the big C. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so regrading, a lot of grading, um, a lot of working with construction to see things that they may not see. So going out in the field is was very, very important. Keeping ahead of the game and, and anticipating issues and meeting with everyone on a regular basis out in the field was uh, also really important. Here's another before and after the same wetland at Arroyo de los Playaños. Um, we actually named this wetland. It, it was a no-name wetland, but it means Arroyo of the Beaches, so we kind of like that. We were able to name the bridge and name the wetland. Um, so you can see we took out that prism of land, that fill and that culvert, and then we connected the freshwater seep wetland and uh, coastal prairie wetlands on either side. So you can't really tell there was a road there. Let me get to my notes to see what I wrote about this slide. You can see in the distance, the existing road fill and culvert of the old road. Uh, once a new road was operational, the old road was removed. So that's kind of another key thing is working with traffic design, staging with the contractor, trying to anticipate the staging methods in design to know when they're gonna move traffic and then the restoration efforts that happen. Once you move all the traffic onto the new road, then you know your job's not over you still have to go in and do all the demo of where the old road was right, after construction right. the intent was to have no indication the old road was ever there contour grading and planting of freshwater seep wetlands here's another before and after um looking west from the north slope near the new bridge at arroyo del corral and um, you can see that there was a finger of land uh, where the old road was, but we had to maintain some of that rise in elevation because it had naturally created a wetland behind it. So by taking out that finger of land completely would have drained the wetland we anticipated. So we left, up, we left that ground slightly higher and we had to go in and regrade it um, at one point after construction because it wasn't exactly what we wanted in our follow-up restoration project. <clears throat> so the old culvert was removed and you're gonna see pictures of that. You can see there's a culvert here right by the white truck. It was a big culvert, like six by six and um, elephant seals were getting through that. So the timing and working with an, um, National Marine Fisheries on excluding elephant seals and the timing and the tides and the seasons. It was very complicated on when we could get in there and do that and pull the culvert out. And as soon as we pulled it out, uh, the elephant seals, they love it. <laughs> I'll show you a clip <laughs> in the end here in a second. <clears throat> After Caltrans had to pay an extra $219,000 for a wider creek than was originally mapped, the regrading at the old road necessary for the creation of wetlands at appropriate elevation. All right, talked about that. Orange ESA fencing areas are pr 
protected during construction and are now monitoring reference areas and wetland restoration areas on floodplain and adjacent slopes. We also learned through all of this that um, elephant seals are more visual. So we ended up replacing a lot of this orange fencing with black mesh fencing. Even though they're very big and very heavy, uh, they could just plow through the fencing, but because of the black fencing, they see it as a barrier so they wouldn't go mm -hmm. through it. So we, we learned that as we were working and we replaced a lot of the fencing with black mesh. More area than planned was used by um, uh, environmental studies, elephant seal, inclusionary fencing used black fencing more visible as a deterrent to elephant seals to prevent them from getting onto the new highway. highway. We had a few elephant seals get onto the highway during construction and it was very uh, difficult to get them off the highway. Challenging, challenging to move them. And you can see here uh, the drainage north of the hotel. That was the fourth drainage I wasn't able to remember. Um, and you can see as we pulled out the roadway and the culvert, we started to get um, a head, head cut. We addressed that by using uh, old methods of uh, willow cuttings, uh, the tensile strength in uh, willow cutting roots are very strong. They've been, been used in China for thousands of years. So we've used a lot of willow methods for um, helping with some of the erosion issues we had on this project. Here's a before and after. So you can see the head cut. So this highway had been there for close to, I don't know, 70 years at this, lo this location. And that culvert had uh, established, you know, an elevation. So once we took it out, mother nature, because it's been held in this one static location for so long, it's kind of self-correcting and with sea level rise and and, um, and uh, erosion, coastal erosion. This is happening all over the world. This, you know, head cut and erosion. So in order to make sure that this head cut didn't go into our wetland restoration credit area, we, we had to think out of the box and we, with all these wet, uh, willow cuttings, we were able to prevent the head cut. Lessons learned, I guess. <laughs> so this is from the original slide I showed you at the very beginning of the project. This is at a location called Arroyo del Oso. It's the most northern um, wetland area. And the rock slope protection was taken out. And you can see over time, looking at the trees, how much uh, the coast has kind of recorrected itself. And now we're, you know, five years later, and it's even more so. Um, coastal erosion, sea level rise is definitely an issue. This location where the waves were hit, splashing up over the road, it was the reason the project was initiated. Years of placing rock slope protection, large boulders of riprap along this coast to protect the stretch of road from onslaught of wave action and sea level rise. And you can see as soon as the section of road uh, and the culvert was removed, the area immediately started to reach natural landform. It was hard to plan for this because a lot of the agencies wanted us to have a perfect plan of what we mm -hmm. thought the mitigation and restoration was gonna be. And we came up with what we thought was gonna be, but in the end, it kind of just became what it, what it became, another <laughs> nature and the wave action, especially during the king tides. The before and after at Arroyo del also looking east. So this is where we built the bridge to the east. And right in here was a red-legged frog breeding pond. During construction, the stream avoided was avoided for bridge construction, but some riparian vegetation was removed from the bank. But due to shading of the bridge, um, mitigation was required. Revegetation mostly failed at this location, but the replacement willow plantings mostly survived. 
Well, here's some of the uh, more of the avoidance and minimization and mitigation measures. Like I talked about earlier, we developed these ideas early in the project and wove them into the environmental and, and project report have language and funding for these out of the box ideas. So these came very early in the project and I'm glad we built them into the project because it made for a very successful um, implementation. We needed the entire design team, including construction buy off to make sure that they were um, on board to build, a, uh, build this into the project. Also, you had to consider working days and how long things are gonna take. It all adds costs to the project total. Uh, and you also needed to make sure that these ideas were buildable and had value. We collected six inches of valuable topsoil collection and placement. It was a big push by our department, mostly me, early in the planning. It took many meetings to describe to the engineering and construction side of the house the importance of topsoil, that it's a living thing and not just dirt <laughs> to be driven on. <laughs> Um, mycorrhizae and the native seed bank for successful restoration and stormwater permits. I haven't really delved into the whole stormwater permit world, but that's another key part of what we do to um, build in B BMPs, which are considered best management practices to prevent um, stormwater runoff off any construction project and um, slow the water down and make the allow the water to to percolate into the ground, which is a divine shift of how I was taught back, you know, 40 years ago, which was to get the water off quickly. Now it's slow it down, let it percolate, and um, to prevent soil erosion. And, um, you know, all you see, we're near creeks too, and the ocean. So yeah, groundwater there. recharge, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So big, big part of the project was stormwater issues. We developed plans, um, signage for storage, which was also key. You can see the orange sign. Um, we considered these to be ESAs because we realized the contractor was driving on them. So we had to ESA them and um, uh, prevent the contractors with all their big trucks from driving on the stock. And then we also labeled them so that we could reuse these soils in the same vegetation type that they were pulled from. Tech sensing. And, by, and by ESA, by ESA, Kevin, you mean environmentally sensitive area? Is that what you mean by ESA? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so after discovering the contractor was using these areas for access roads, I almost lost it. So we had to have a big meeting to tell them they couldn't <laughs> use it for access roads. The whole reason why we were the soil was for whatever purpose, you know, we couldn't have compacted soils. You know, you guys know about soils, so I don't need to go into that probably, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. We, we found it was an uh, excellent as a sediment control fence as well. This um, earth tech fencing, but the primary reason for the earth tech fencing was um, to keep out elephant seals and also red legged frog. Hmm. Whole road locations. We already talked about that. We had to identify and quantify impacts for in egress and ingress, as well as staging areas for the contractor. Everything had to be spelled out and constantly. You know. They're, the construction sites are constantly changing and moving and everything's dynamic. So it's really important to follow your projects out to construction because it never goes according to plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, drainage designs during permitting process, Army Corps of Engineers asked to change one of the large culverts proposed um, to a several smaller ones to spread out the flow. So that's just one example of a, of a change kind of late in the game. I had talked about um, their mitigation um, and minimization measures. We had exclusionary fencing and cattle for cattle and frogs. I talked about the fencing plans and how important it was to differentiate all the different fencings. I think we had seven different kinds of fencing and it also was phased. So very complicated. So the Urtec fencing, you can see it down here, um, uh, cordoning off areas for the contractor. So the contractor can't, can't get in there. You can see the uh, wetland mats that we used. Um, there were three new bridges where previously they were just culverts. Arroyo del Corral was used, uh, used a trestle avoidance measure. 
and Arroyo del Oso crossed streams. Arroyo del de los Peñanos crossed a swale, a wetland, and used a trestle avoidance. Construction impacts were minimized. Platforms or trestles, the two of the longest bridges. Wetland mats for equipment to drive over to minimize compaction. And the trestle at Arroyo del Corral avoided the need for full stream diversion, which is an important thing to understand. Anytime you're down in a creek, and if it's a perennial creek and it's flowing all year round, you typically have to build a freshwater diversion, which requires ponds and pumps and pipes. So with this method, we didn't have to do a dewatering and diversions, which really uh, saved um, the project, not only a lot of money, but time and it um, had the least amount of impacts on the project. Another avoidance um, was steepening the slopes at Arroyo del Corral to minimize wetland impact. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So like I said, we did contour grading to make uh, old roadbed look natural once we took the road out. And that's this over here on the left-hand side. And then over here on the right-hand side shows the steepened slopes that we had to put in um, and get a design exception for to steepen those slopes so that the footprint of that fill slope at the end of the bridge did not eat into wetlands. When we did a value analysis on this project in the design phase, we had a longer bridge and it bypassed that need for that fill slope. But because we had a value analysis, they said, well, if we shorten the bridge and go to that knoll there, then we'll put in a fill slope, which, so it was, it, it did add value in cost and engineering, but in my opinion, the value was, I think we should have had a longer bridge. Anyway, I wasn't part of that decision-making process. <laughs> um, native seed, for example, no more than, uh, we, we had strict criteria. Um, we collected seed no more than 10 to 15 miles away from the project, although the contract did attempt to collect the seed the first year, the drought made it really challenging and they weren't able to collect enough. So they, they bid too low to do a seed increase pro program. So you know, you're constantly working on uh, uh, creative design solutions throughout the project, just because you do it in design and you go to bid and it goes out to construction doesn't mean that you constantly aren't um, having to work out uh, problem solving. Uh, with US Fish and Wildlife Service consultation during construction, re construction required Caltrans to conduct black abalone monitoring before, during, and after the rock removal to see if the activity affected the inner tile zones. Utilities took a long time because they were done concurrently in construction and had to be jacked underground in some cases. Um, Visual impacts with utilities and the Coastal Commission attempted to get Caltrans to try to screen certain parts of the construction work. This was found to be infeasible, but it's extensive time and documentation. So this just shows some of the construction challenges. We had also a burrowing owl that decided to build a nest in one of our construction sections. We had shut down the work, uh, red-legged frog, uh, turtles, uh, tidewater goby, and then that big culvert that we took out, very challenging. And I don't know if you guys know about this. I actually, I just watched it a couple weekends ago. There's a really fun old cult movie called The Monster of Piedras Blancas. It's kind of like the birds. Anyway, it takes place at Piedras. They filmed some of it down south at another lighthouse, but it takes place in Cayucas. And I highly recommend watching this. We got to watch that. We got to watch that. Black and white great. movie. Yeah. I think. Okay, here we go. Hope this works. Hold on. This is where we took out the culvert. Nice. A few marine mammals in there. A few. This is. I take it back. This is before we took out the culvert. <laughs> uh, this is fun to watch. You guys get to see them on Friday. Absolutely.
All right. So we can go straight into another presentation, or if you want to take another five minute break, it's up to you. Yeah, questions. Questions so far about this stuff. Again, again, the goal is always um, here's the thing we want to do. Is it possible to, and then look at potential harms that might come. Uh, and so then, hey, can we redesign something to avoid the harms in the first place? That's the ideal, that's the ideal thing. We can't always do that. The next would be to minimize the, you know, would do whatever we can to, yeah, we have impacts, but to have them be smaller in scale or smaller duration or something like that. And then for whatever we just can't eliminate or reduce, we just have to, to mitigate for those impacts. So we just sort of admit that we're taking the hit and we have to do something. Um, and again, in an area like this, with all these, all this jurisdiction, all the sensitive landscape, sensitive critters, uh, uh, all that stuff, it just makes it that much harder. Because when you push in one direction, that might be good for one agency or one, one resource uh, concern. And then it pushes us into another thing, right? So it might be great to have no impact on the beach, but then we'd have an impact on the wetland or, or whatever, right? And so it's this constant balancing act. And I'll just also add, as Catherine is changing over the next presentation, I'll just add that um, one of our projects up in the San Francisco Bay Area the, the, that you guys have heard about, the, um, the levee, horizontal levee project, um, that cost was twice, not for us, not for Dr. Cafella or me, but, but for the construction companies, twice the cost that we budgeted. And, uh, it, you know, it was done by all the engineers and stuff, so they didn't make the numbers up. They, they were correct, but it took so long to do the contracting. You know, the grant has to be reviewed, and then it's six months of this, and it's six months of that, that the prices of stuff went up so much that we had to go get more money from the agency and stuff. And, and so, so as you go through these challenges, not, very few things are staying constant. So other environmental challenges are burbling up as well as budgetary constraints are burbling up. And so that's another issue that you have to constantly be, be managing. And it, yes. if we just take forever, it's gonna be more expensive no matter what, so. And, and to add to that, Sean, it's really important to document your decisions and who you make your decisions with because people and agencies change. Opinions change, I hate to say that, but it does, yep, they do. Yep. Totally. And you need to have, not like an MOU, but to have like a decision matrix and keep track of it because it's really important late in the game, later on, you know, when you're building stuff to be, well, to be transparent throughout, establish relationships with agency personnel and and really work together. You can't be working against each other or um, sometimes you just have to turn your cheek and really swallow your pride and yeah. and you just need to work together. I don't know how else to say that, but- uh, No, it's true, it's true. And, and, it's and, really, really important. Yeah, and, and, and I'm working and, on- I'm just working on another project that's really, really exciting. It's up at Scott Creek up in Santa Cruz, a lagoon restoration project. And it's it's a very, um, I know very unique is redundant, but it is a yeah. unique project in the sense that it's a long lead and the way it's funded, we're doing it in sections, but we're being very transparent with the agencies, permitting agencies, and we have um, meetings with them all the time to show them our decision design process, all the all of the consultant agency input, and it's I've ne I it's wonderful. So I wish all projects could work like that. <laughs> um, anyway, taking a lot of time, it's worth it early on the design phase to work out all the kinks and have everyone understand where we're coming from. They're like there's so many things and challenges that we just need everyone's input and approval as we go. So. Yeah, and, and I'll say that if this was a if this was a private apartment building or something, right? There'd be like you know these these things are also important, but but in this case, this is a, a you know public employee, and so mm -hmm. so people can say, I want to file a Freedom of Information Act, and how did you make your decisions, and all this and that. Mm -hmm. And while that's always been an issue, or, or that that setting has always been the case. Um, in recent years, in particular, we're, we we have so much animosity towards each other, and there's so many people that just are 
like yeah. people that think differently than me are evil and everything. It's even harder to have those those conversations and, yeah. and to be engaged in this system. And so I think that's that's important to say. And then another observation I'll just make that Catherine doesn't have to make, but I'll make as the professor <laughs> guy that won't have to get in trouble with someone is um, uh, it, it seems very similar to me to um, uh, misconduct on the football field, right? So when you're watching football, somebody might bam, bam somebody, and then the guy gets bam, it's like, what? And he pushes back. It's rarely the first guy that does the shoving or the tripping or the whatever, right? Because the ref's not looking. But then all of a sudden that draws the ref's eye and the ref looks over and then he sees the person reacting to the, to the assault. And like, that guy's getting a foul. You know, that guy's getting kicked out of the game. And that's the same here, right? So if we had a pure 100% pristine coast that no one had touched, this wouldn't be a problem. It'd be easy to move a road or whatever. But we're in this situation with all of our management situations because we've taken historic actions that have compromised some of our resources, that have limited us. And so now, instead of having red-legged frogs up the yin-yang, we have limited numbers of red-legged frogs. And so now it's, it's very similar to the first, first player kind of caused the foul and nobody paid attention, but now we're worried about red-legged frogs. So now the, the sort of coming after the fact group could be Caltrans, could be whomever, is held to a higher standard, right? And you might be saying, well, but in the past, we, we just realigned it this way, or we just dumped some riprap, or we just whatever. It's like, well, yeah, but now we've decided that's not how we're playing. And so yeah. it, it sometimes feels unfair, but that's the world that we're in. That's the world we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I have, I have a quick question for you. Um, mm -hmm. So as someone, I've, I've surveyed all of those sites for, for tidewater goobies, like like Sean said, and red legged frogs and pond turtles since um, since 2011. So I've been I've been in those in all those systems, you know, Oso and Corral and De La Cruz, all the way down to like you know, there's a, a lot of really cool sites there, like Arroyo de Tortuga and stuff, which we're gonna take the students to. Um, when you were doing, so I was there before the the I did a lot of surveys before the um, you started the project those systems you know would desiccate a lot during drought period so so there was a, they would dry up quite a bit and then you know i noticed that a lot that that whole lagoon is was kind of there's a lot more lagoonal features there after the the restoration how much went into you know the design of that or the thought behind creating kind of a more sustainable lagoon feature that could possibly you know, maintain some type of water during drought periods. That's a unique site too, because, you know. You mean at Arroyo del Corral? At Corral, yeah. Okay. Because, you know, it's, it's these, these lagoons, especially on that coast are so unique because, you know, you don't really find amphibians right next to the coast a lot of times, but you, or a, a, like pond turtles and stuff, mm -hmm. usually upstream but you're finding them around the coast and they need water. And so um, it, you know, but also if you kind of create too much variety in the, the, you know, expanding the lagoon too much and it breaches, you know, a little bit more than usual, it can kind of impede a lot of those types of animals from persisting there. What was kind of that dynamic of, of deciding how big to make the lagoon or how to widen things up with the, the hydrology and the function of, of that lagoon? Well, that's a good question. Um, it would, I would need to probably refer back to biology, the aquatic specialists and the hydraulic engineers, but as a landscape architect working on the landform grading uh, what we did was we took out the culvert mm -hmm. and we just collectively decided because the wetlands had been created behind that raised um, fill slope, mm -hmm. we, we left, um, I think it was about 18 inches so that the natural, the natural wave action, which it does over top, you know, you've probably seen that the yep. salt water does intrude now. Um, and, but we had to protect our footprint to not create more impacts by taking it completely out. So we left that to, 
keep the wetlands behind it and let it just naturally restore. And that's what, that's what it is now. And, yeah. you know, as, as the years go on, it just keeps recorrecting itself naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Especially cool. two up at Arroyo del Oso. I mean, you yep. noticed that, right? Yeah. 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 The systems to every time I've got I've been up there um maybe two or three times since since COVID too. And I mean it, I think there is we see it with a lot of lagoons, right? Even with like Malibu Lagoon Restoration, which was a much larger one, um, Pescadero, like it, you know, you have these these ideas of what you're going to strive for the restoration, but then after five years, after 10 years, the system really evolves and, and kind of yeah. know, balances out in some way. And so it's interesting to see how that, how that, how that goes. It's very dynamic. Yeah. And, um, and things are seeming to speed up right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share. I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't have to watch myself. <laughs> okay, can you see this? Yep, yep looks good. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> so now for the challenges in construction. We, uh, I'm going to show a video. So that's another reason why I turned off my camera so I can move my screen. I have two screens in front of me. So you can see from the video, there were fine plastic particles in the compost. The compost specification at the time had a weight requirement, the plastics in the compost. Pla plastics don't weigh very much, so it wasn't measurable, but it was visible. So this changed our specification policy now that reads visible plastics. So we lessons learned we, we shut down the compost operation um, pretty early on on the project and we required the contractor to vacuum up the plastics and um, as it was starting to flow in windrows from the wind so we shut down the compost application on this project which was uh, very unfortunate because I really wanted to use compost on this um, road realignment project but luckily I built in the topsoil um, collection and placement and the native seed and um, native seed applications. So I had those of a three prong approach. I had still had two of the three. So uh, the project still re restored very well, but I think it would have been better if we had had the compost as part of the project. So other challenges um, were bats roosting in the tile roof of one of the buildings that we had to take down at the end of the project. Uh, so we had um, uh, um, methods to go out at night and um, do night surveys. And uh, the second time the project biologist had bats using the structure posts for demolition, exclusionary methods to work fast in one night, night work demolition, militia, as you can see. So it was a coordination, kind of like a dance, trying to get this um, demoed in one night. And we have a biologist that specialized in bats, and it was really cool. I wasn't there for that, but um, it was really fascinating how they, they did the whole bat exclusionary and demo of the house. And can you, can you talk real quick uh, about that, uh, Catherine, unless you're going to talk about it on Friday. But so so you guys know this is this is um, this is uh, landward of where the freeway was, and these were relatively new houses that were built, um, in part because of the time it took to do this. This project was you know decades in the making, and so when it was finally taken over, there was this structure that was built, and the and the bats had 
had essentially taken up, uh, you know, set up home in that in these these homes. So before they could demolish the right. homes, they had to grab the bats. Is that did I have that right, Catherine? Right. So originally there were four homes, the Welsh property and three properties that had this tile roof um, construction. And those were owned by a man named Dr. Sani. And one house was removed to build the new alignment. That came out pretty quickly. I wasn't there for when that came out. The second house, which is what they're showing here, the demo of this house, um, was kept on site during the construction of the roadway. And um, it was used as a resident engineer office. So both of those houses were taken down and they had both had to have these bad exclusionary methods done. So then there was one Sani house left, which is still standing. It's the most Eastern house. It's, it's for sale if anyone wants to buy it. It'll be on the market again as soon as we're done sure. with construction. No problem. No problem. Um, and it looks very similar to this, you know, this style, Spanish style house. And then there was a house on the north, and that was the Welsh property. The Welsh property, because we bisected their long, their long property with the road, we ended up buying it because they wanted to sell it to Caltrans, and they no longer wanted the property. So then it was then it was state property, and the whole time, um, we were designing this wetland project. I kept recommending that we just tear down the Welsh property and build wetlands. And anyway, long story, but it turns out we ended up doing that. And that's why we're now building wetlands where these three houses used to be because historically they were coastal prairie wetlands. But for some reason, back in the day when they were built, they were allowed to build on wetlands and we don't understand why that happened. But um, so that's <laughs> why we have the hydraulics to, to we're, that's why we're building these wetlands and then I'll show you on Friday because historically in this location, they were wetlands. So because we the, these three houses were taken down, it allowed us to build the original uh, awesome. well. Thank you. And then we have one more, we have one quick question here from one of my students. Yeah, um, huh? I was wondering, so did you say these houses were vacant? Like, were they built just as like a housing project and Caltrans bought them? Or did, did they have people living in there that you used eminent domain or how'd that work? Eminent domain on the two that you see here in the photograph, the Welsh property, they wanted to sell to us. And I don't know the whole history on it, but because we bisected their land in half, their well was on the west side and their house was on the east side. Um, we ended up buying that property from the Welsh family. So then we owned, you know, three lots, basically. Uh, two were pretty much, well, they were all bisected by the new road. But um, eminent domain, I'd say, on these two. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Which happens, right, to build, build new roads. You have to come in and offer them. Uh, market value on the homes. Good question. So I think you might recall that um, another challenge was the barrier to exclude elephant seals from entering the culvert prior to the removal. So it was a very big timing uh, and coordination effort with the National Marine Sanctuaries to um, get those pups that had maybe made their way to the east through the culvert. Um, we put up the barrier and then moved some elephant seals with their help. Um, those are the wieners they call, the little juveniles that are weaning themselves from their mom. They got too far up the creek and so we had to capture them and move them west. And then I had mentioned, um, the removal of that culvert once it was um we had to drain that like i told you we you know with the clear water diversion but sometimes you just need to drain the water out just to get in there and do the work so uh all the environmental folks um, that i worked with for years they were down in this muck 
and taking out, they took out over 1,200 fish, including tidewater goby, like I said before, six California red-legged frogs and 13 southwestern pond turtles were relocated from Arroyo del Corral during the removal of the culvert. They found sea hare, seal poop, and biting, a biting boatman. I guess that's the name of the kind of turtle. Brenton, do you want to comment on that? I don't know what it's called. Um, another challenge in construction was, I mentioned the removal of 20,000 tons of rock that had been that was removed and that would, had been placed there over years and years and years to try to protect the road. Uh, black abalone habitat was a regulatory challenge. The fabric became a challenge. Um, usually when you place rock, you put fabric underneath it and trying to get that out was also a challenge. Um, getting out of the bluff was also a very hairy ordeal to get all that heavy equipment close to the cliff without the cliff collapsing on them. <laughs> so I had mentioned, um, we did, uh, once the road was realigned, we came back in and over the same footprint of the road realignment, we did a three-year on-site landscape contract um, where we, uh, we put in um, we restored the wetlands, like I had mentioned, with um, pulling the sod and plugs from the adjacent wetlands. Um, and then we did a three-year um, establishment contract. But for the course of that, we discovered some invasives that came in, um, primarily the uh, clover, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But the specs were written to protect the existing wetlands, um, where we took sod and plugs out. We had very strict criteria that not more than 25% of the wetlands would be impacted, no vehicles. Um, they did have to bring in a hand auger with flat attachment where the soil was too dense with dry, dry soils. So we discovered there was an uh, overgrowth of burr clover on the old alignment and that required some pretty quick evaluation of different methods to address the invasives. I did a, a deep dive, um, a quick deep dive on <clears throat> different ways we could use fire, which required pretty close coordination with Cal Fire that does control burns for free. So we were gonna do that. We got it all prepped and we were waiting for the right wind conditions and on and on and on with our public information officer. And then the Paradise Fire happened and all, all the fire people went north to take care of the horrible fire up north. So the next lowest carbon footprint idea that I came up with was using goats um, instead of herbicide or mowing or um, plastic tarps, you know, fire was out. So, um, I quickly coordinated a contract as a change order because this was now in construction. So I didn't have to build it into the project itself. So I, um, we, we implemented the goat grazing uh, idea and um, that's what we did. And it was very successful. We did it twice. And I have uh, several, um, Interviews with NPR, public, our local public radio, and um, lots of interesting um, newspaper articles and interviews. It was great having the goats out there. It was really fun. We had a woman shepherdess who was great, also. So try to think out of the box. And I actually I have a meeting at eleven that I need to go to, so I might not be able to get through everything. But I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, some of the invasives. They're listed here. I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, we have different agency regulations um, where we can use herbicides and can't use herbicides within a 100-foot buffer of the wetlands. And um, like I said, we were going to do a control burn. Um, took a lot of prep to get that done and met with Cal Fire out there. And we were going to do it. And all of a sudden, it fell through. So these were the two wetlands we developed um, using the bentonite. Um, 
lessons learned is I designed them too deep. So they actually turned out to be freshwater seed wetlands, but we still got wetland credit from the agencies and they're functioning really well. So uh, lessons learned is to make coastal prairie wetlands shallower, which you'll see on Friday. That's what you're going to see is shallower wetlands. And then we also included best management practices, like I talked about with stormwater. We're slowing the water down before they goes down into culverts um, to let the sediment drop out and to slow the velocities of the water. Um, you can see here the swales conveying the diverted water off the bridges. And other challenges uh, around Arroyo del Cacao, you can see that the elephant seals, once they had uh, access, they were just over the world. So we had to put up more fencing. We're starting to approach on our wetland uh, wet creation areas. Yeah, big disturbance source. <laughs> yeah, lots of compaction. So here's some er erosion remediation. I we use that black um, fencing, like I told, told you about, which really helped with their keeping them excluded using the black fencing. And then we also use some really cool methods of using willow wattles in some of the gullies to establish vegetation to slow the erosion down. And then I'm just going to go right into my next. Uh, cool presentation. Yeah, I have a big meeting in uh, 14 minutes. Another big meeting. <laughs> awesome. If I don't address all your questions now, uh, you know, you can just save your questions for Friday. Totally. Okay, so I'm just going to dip quickly into um, mitigation and monitoring. So I went out with some of the biologists and helped do some of the vegetation monitoring, counting plants every inch and um, documenting, and that all went into the monitoring reports. Um, so these are showing some of the mitigation ratios. This is from the Coastal Development Permit and CDP mean. It's a CDP, so I, I think I've been using that term. So Coastal Development Permit from Coastal Commission. And uh, in the emergent wetlands, there's, I told you about all the different parameters, what defines certain, um, what defines a wetland and from different agencies. We were going to do an off-site mitigation at Arroyo del Arroyo, um, Oh, Corral, oh, sorry, uh, Arroyo de las Cruces, north of the project, but it didn't happen for various reasons I can't get into in this meeting. So that's why we're now mitigating on site. Like I said, you need the to see back. monsters of the theater. Then you can see our monster was the elephant seal. So. <laughs> Um, we had different performance standards like I had talked about in terms of what, what determined cover of wetland plants um, and uh, different resources that were monitored, revegetation, bird diversity, stream stability, and photo monitoring. As you can see, there are a lot of monitoring sites and a lot of mapping done by the biologists and a lot of in, in the monitoring reports that were then given to the agencies. And like I said, there are also not only vegetation monitoring, but bird monitoring. There's lots of, we had a golden eagle out there, uh, bald eagles, uh, like I said, killed deer, um, kites, um, marsh falcons, I don't know, Brenton, you pro I'm probably getting it wrong, um, egrets, great blue herons, all kinds of birds, it's really fun, pelicans. Those all sound about right. Mm -hmm. Pretty fun, love going out there in construction, sitting in my truck and watching all the birds fly around. <laughs> so this shows more vegetation monitoring locations, a lot of documentation. Um, different vegetation monitoring methods that I won't go into, and lots of science. This just shows um, a couple clips from our monitoring reports showing um, 
invasives and natives and all the different uh, plant communities. And that is a wrap. Awesome. That's a, that's a fantastic overview. Everybody's clapping, everybody's clapping. Uh, <laughs> that's great, Catherine, thank you so much. That's an awesome introduction um, to this site and to this, uh, the context for this, this uh, realignment that leads into this thing, that leads into that thing, that leads into that thing. And next thing you know, you're working on you know, 25 different projects to, to get to the original goal, but that's awesome. That's great. All right, good. Well, um, I know that was a lot and it's okay if you don't have any questions, but if you think of something between now and Friday or even when you're out on the site, um, you know, don't be shy. Nothing's a bad question. Um, we don't have ticks right now, but I would err on caution to bring tick spray, tuck your pants and your socks. I know it looks goofy, but I've had many ticks, ticks on me out there. Um, where we're going should be pretty tick free, but uh, no poison oak per se, sunscreen, hard hat, vest, um, pack a lunch, you know, the whole drill. So awesome. And if you're running late, no big deal. I'm going to be up there inspecting and helping the contractor. So I'll be up there all day anyway. So um, Perfect. If it's late or early, no matter, I'll be there. Yeah. So our target is to get to you about 10 30. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, we don't always have good cell phone coverage up there, but but if, if I do and we're late, I'll I'll try to give you a poke. But yeah, we'll see you sometime. Well, we have to start with the contractor on site. Oh, you guys so do. You guys do. I, but I don't yeah. know. If I do. Yeah, you're going to be in and out of coverage. I think you lose it um, right around Cambria. Yeah, there's yeah. a couple of spots where you'll lose it, but um, just past the project, you're pretty much out of cell coverage, but it's spotty. All awesome. right. Well, sounds okay, so good. Any, 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 any quick questions for, again, we can ask questions in a couple days, but any other quick questions? All right, so with that, we'll say thank you, dear. That was awesome. We'll see you in a couple days. All right, well, thanks for allowing me to present this wonderful project. It's taken awesome. over my life. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. See you soon, kid. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.